This segment of Hack 5 is brought to you by Domain.com. Hello and welcome to Hack 5. My name is Darren Kitchen. I am Shannon Morse. This is your weekly dose of Technolust. Yes, and should, should we say goodbye? We should say goodbye once and for all to the jib. To the jib. And, and it's... We loved you, jib. You were huge. I hit my head on you several times. We should have a B-roll shot right now so you understand. Of the jib. It's just in the way. I um, remember when you first got this thing and I was just like, how are we going to fit that in this room? It's like a brontosaurus. <laughs> it's, it's like a... <laughs> Wait, I heard that wasn't our thing. So, um, what? actually, no, it goes back to season one. We were like, dude, we should get, we get a jib. This? Yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. And so we did. But now we're saying goodbye to the jib, and we will introduce you guys to the new Hack 5 stripper pole as soon as that is installed. But we are very excited <laughs> to be going vertical. Or cheers something. to cheers. Tear, cheers to the jib. Yes. We loved you. Thank you for your hard work. Also to Sarah for her hard, hard work moving the jib. Also known as a camera crane. <laughs> And uh, BT dubs to the ones that are that care. Oh, I'm yeah. having Anchor Steam, which I'm is a delicacy here in the Bay. A Stiegel by Stiegel Radler. Yeah, well, the Radler is a type of Stiegel. Stiegel's ah, the company. Okay. So it's a Stiegel Radler. It's a German it's beer. because of you, Seb. Here's cheers to you. Yes. We miss you. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah we've got a, dude, I'm so excited. We've got a great episode. Uh, yeah, what's a, going on this episode? Well, I had a fantastic time at Torcon, sans oh, a snubsy boo, man, but other than that. I was so sad. Yeah. I was just running away with the duckies, so yeah, I had better so things to I do. Heard. Yeah. It's funny, I'm too, because there were, there were only ducks at DerbyCon, and there were only uh, pineapples at Torcon, so oh, there, interesting. there you go. Yeah, you I should yeah. probably stop stealing those things from yeah, you guys please, so you can please. actually do your job. <laughs> so, um, we had an awesome pleasure to meet up with Kyle Osborne as well as Mike Osman, who I like to call Yay! lovingly Cosman. They are a <laughs> dynamic duo. I wish that you could have been there to see it. If, if Torcon releases the videos, that's the one to watch because it was fantastic seeing them play off of each other. And I hope that some of that comes through in this interview that I'm about to throw to, where they basically <laughs> took Cos's research from last time, where, you know, with that awesome cable and doing nasty things from one Android to phone to another, have, absolutely abused a side channel attack that I didn't even know was in the spec and who yes. did it's amazing so I'm just gonna throw that right. wow let's check it out hey guys I'm still here at Torcon 2013 the hangover wore off and look who I found it's Kyle Osborne and Mike Osman the hangover is just beginning <laughs> <laughs> uh, you guys like just threw down some really ridiculously awesome stuff uh, walk us through why we should care about multiplexing instead of just attacking a USB stack well, uh, uh, every, uh, as far as I know, every modern smartphone and tablet these days has some kind of multiplex uh, wired interface, whether it's a USB port or a headphone jack. And there's something connected, there's something that you can connect that will behave in a way that you might not expect. Like, you know, we were showing yesterday doing something other than USB over a USB port. And it's, uh, it's like, there's an attack surface there that people recognize. You know, you recognize that there's an attack, the attack surface to a probe like a USB stack when you uh, connect to the USB port. But there is less awareness, I think, that there's even a greater attack surface than that. There are, there are branches you can take other than just fun functioning as a USB device. So, so give me some examples of, I'm sorry, I'm gonna move over here too, but give me some examples of how uh, some ports might be duplicated with different functionality that maybe we take for granted and have that like, aha, like, oh, right, that headphone jack is more than for just stereo audio. Yeah, so uh, I think that the main ones are uh, um, interfaces for programming devices or debugging devices. Uh, so there will be a, a debug port, usually a serial interface of some kind, um, that, uh, that you can use to, like, Get a, a, a debug, inter interactive debugger, or a shell, uh, or some kind of an interface that allows you to uh, like load new software onto the device. Those kinds of things, um, and uh, you know, we and we've seen those on both headphone jacks and USB jacks in particular. You guys are talking about like the I, the old iPhone Shuffle or iPhone Shuffle, the uh, the, the F1 one, the uh, iPod Shuffle, where. You know, you can load the music over that special. It's like USB on one end and headphone on the other. Um, this is the was this building on top of the stuff that we were talking about last year uh, at uh, Torque Camp that you were doing, Cause? Uh, yeah, actually, 
a little bit of it came from, I wanted to know how much further you could get without ADB, and we happened to stumble across these sorts of functionalities that uh, turned into the ability to enable or uh, get shell on a device in some cases without ADB, which you know made it way better because now we don't have to worry about whether or not ADB is enabled on it. Right, because if ADB is enabled on my phone, and you've got your toolkit running, uh, you've got some awesome cable of some sort that allows you to hook your phone <laughs> to my phone, uh, what does that enable you to do? Yeah, so if you do have ADB enabled, then you can do all sorts of fun stuff. Um, there was some stipulations now, actually Google has caught on and they figured out that ADB enabled is kind of an issue and you do need some sort of okay from the user. But uh, in, in the past when ADB was enabled, you used to actually be able to do all sorts of fun things such as unlocking the screen, uh, stealing all the user contacts, stealing all the, uh, pretty much any of the data on the phone itself, right? So uh, it was incredibly powerful. And so now that uh, you know ADB is locked down, if only there was a way to re-enable it, how do you start going about looking at, say, these connectors and realizing that there are other modes that they can get into rather than just, well, hey, it's a USB port, doesn't go right to the USB stack? Well, there's a, there's a separate multiplexer IC on these devices and between the connector and whatever you'd expect it to be plugged into, like between the USB connector and the USB device controller. With, with, with the multiplexer, it actually kind of becomes akin to like a, a, a network socket, right? Because you have port 80. Port 80 doesn't necessarily always need to be HTTP, same as, you know, port 1234 can be anything you want. You can make it HTTP, you can make it a uh, sub debug port, or you can make it MySQL, or whatever you want. Right. So that's uh, it's, it's kind of a, akin to that. Yeah, so that, I mean, that's uh, those are examples of like, uh, you know, virtual or software multiplex functions. And in this case, we have a hardware multiplex function um, with an actual chip that's like detect, trying to detect what device is plugged in and, uh, you know, and switching the port physically to a different function. So how would you switch the port physically? Like talking about USB, how do I plug something in there and it recognize, oh, this isn't necessarily a typical USB client device. Does it say talk to it over the USB protocol and then switch into a different mode later? Or, or how does that work? No, it, it isn't really talking over the USB protocol. In the, all the cases that we've seen, uh, it's using the ID pin, which is the fifth pin and most recent addition to the pinout of, uh, of USB connectors. Uh, and uh, originally the ID pin was added kind of for a multiplex function where, where uh, for on the go, for USB on the go. So you could, uh, by, by depending on how you, uh, what you plug into that pin, you could either cause the device to operate as a device or cause it to operate as a host. But now, they've started with these multiplexer ICs, the, they've started uh, detecting more than just two states on that ID pin. And they detect a, a particular resistance between the ID pin and ground. So all we have to do to try to invoke one of these different modes is take, take a fixed resistor and, uh, a value of our choice and plug it in uh, and see what we get. And so what are those values and what, what do they get you? Well, uh, in, in our talk we, we uh, showed a, a data sheet from one of these multiplexer IC that, ICs that has this big table of all these different resistances that it can detect and kind of a, some idea of what function that might be. Uh, although what exact, what that really gets us depends a lot on, you know, the, which multiplexer IC is installed, uh, how, what it's connected to on the circuit board in the tar target device, and also on the configuration of the software, uh, like the operating system, right, the, the kernel that we're talking to. Um, it, so, but what we do is we just do something like, like this. Uh, what, what is this little guy here? So this is just a homemade uh, device, and an, an adapter, uh, that's just made out of a couple of um, uh, development ports, or uh, just uh, breakout ports. Uh, and it's just a USB micro connector that we plug into our target. Yeah. And, uh, and then it has this blue resistor here. So we just solder in a resistor between the IP and the ground, and then it's connected to this serial interface, the TTL UART. So basically it's just a run-of-the-mill uh, serial adapter that we can plug into our laptop and control. Uh, the only thing unusual about it is that it 
uses a USB connector instead of a typical serial connector, and it has this one resistor added on. And then that's a hard-coded resistor. You need, that's not a potentiometer or anything to switch between modes because you found the mode that, that deals with UART. So UART, obviously serial, serial TTL. Pause, that brings me to you. Tell me about your love affair with serial. <laughs> uh, so as, as I revealed, uh, as everybody will be astounded in my talk, I've never actually had to deal with serial a lot. Uh, you never and, dialed up 2400 baud? Um, uh, sadly, I haven't actually. Uh, 56k modem maybe, but uh, nothing like that. So uh, I spent a lot of a lot of time trying to figure out um, the best ways of like uh, transferring data across these serial connections in a consistent consistent way. And since I've never had any you know actual experience with that, I spent uh, wasted a lot of time just constantly trying to push over these you know even just a few kilobytes of data. And uh, I I don't even. I, I can't. I don't know. I don't. I, serial. <laughs> how do you work? Like it's it, it's just super inconsistent. Maybe maybe it's the the board that we have, or the board on uh, the, the chipset on the, the phone itself, or something. But I just have a very hard time with it. <laughs> okay, so paint me the scenario here. You said the phone. So you are. We've got the phone. So um, you plug in through the USB. Are you getting like a direct shell on the device? Are you getting the bootloader? What what do you end up with? Uh, so you actually get uh, you get a lot. Uh, Interesting things. If you reboot the phone while you plugged in, you actually see the bootloader sequence. Um, and there are some potential capabilities in there, I believe, to pause the sequence or to restart it. But once you're past that part, uh, you actually get dropped into like a, a, a monitor mode in kernel space, and you get a kernel message output and a few other interesting things. Uh, from there, uh, depending on the phone, uh, if you hit enter a few times, you actually get a, a debug interface. It actually responds with you uh, with a debug prompt. And you type help, and it shows you a few different things you can do. Um, the best things that you can do there is uh, view kernel messages, view the uh, view the, the kernel ID, uh, and uh, see some. I guess you, maybe you could use some of the registers to potentially to put some together some theoretical attacks, but. The really interesting part is the console command, which in some cases actually drops you directly into a shell uh, account on the phone. So you end up being like what, root at Android, or what do you get? So you get a lower level shell user account, and uh, unfortunately for us, uh, it doesn't give you the same permissions you would get if you went through ADB. Uh, this is because when you go through ADB, your user inherits some of the groups uh, that ADB has, so it allows you to access the SD card, it allows you to access some of the user data, a few other interesting things, uh, and you're in a pretty limited uh, interface. Is, is your hope at this point to be able to like push over an APK and execute it, or, or what are you trying to achieve at that point? Hey everybody, we want some quick input. We are doing an online survey to find out a little bit more about our audience, you guys, and also to help us keep giving you our creative free content. So go over to surveymonkey.com slash s slash hack5 and fill out a really quick survey. It only takes about five minutes. It'll definitely help us out. Again, that was surveymonkey.com slash s slash hak5. Thank you so much. No, I'm, I'm going to have to call you back. Actually, hang on just a second. Hey, you know, it really doesn't matter if you're a monkey in the middle or a hacker working for bananas. If you've got that killer idea, when it hits, you need to snag that domain name and the web hosting fast. With Domain.com's quick domain discovery system, it's easy to check out and have your website up and running in no time. I mean, I love Domain.com. They're affordable, reliable, they're easy to use, and they're on social media at Domain.com on Twitter. It makes it a really fun place to do business because there are huge fans of Hack5. So they've got the hookup. Get this, 15% off. They're already affordable domain names and web hosting. All you have to do is use the coupon code HACK5 at checkout. That's right. They've got the hookup, H-A-K-5. So when you think domain names, think domain.com. Yeah, no, 40 tons of bananas. It's time for trivia. Now last week's trivia question was, a 7AG7 is what kind of electron tube? And the answer was loctal. Yes, that's right, loctal. Now this week's question is, what unit of measurement denotes half a byte? Answer that over at hack5.org slash trivia for your chance to win some awesome Hack 5 goodies.